Hans is, you know, in most people's opinion, one of the best drummers um, out, out there in the scene right now. Um, you know, he's made his name playing in some of the most, you know, besides the fact that they just make great music, some of the most technically impressive bands out there. Um, Necrophagist, uh, Obscura, Blotted Science are three names that people, you know, will just think of if they think of, oh, you know, these are some of the most impressive bands out there. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I also, um, you know, really wanted to get a chance to talk to him about is, um, you know, he just does a lot of session work with a lot of different bands. Um, you know, he's got a, you know, a great recording setup. Um, he's been on, you know, so many albums. He just did a solo record um, that um, he masterminded. Um, so, you know, he's been all over the place and just such a good drummer. How's it going? Hello, thank you, very well. Like, after hearing this, it's getting even better. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks yeah. for joining us all the way from Germany. Sure. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to join you. Um, actually, I didn't hear like uh, this chat so far, but um, like what what topics you were discussing. But I'm I'm curious what's what you want to talk about. So, um, well, par partially, um, you know, we just wanted to look at um, you know some of um, the gear that you're using in your setup. I mean, you know, you're you use all mono symbols, and uh, you're you're a Tama player also, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I got like I, I played Tama since I was I think thirteen. Mm -hmm. um, that was my second drum kit, and um, I played that like that set second drum kit like for I think almost ten years, and uh, I don't know, never disappointed me, and um, it's kind of the the sound I was always looking for, and. Um, and uh, the good thing is that the Meinl guys here in Germany also distribute uh, Tama drums. So That's right, yeah. It fits very well. <laughs> and um, Is that how you started playing Meinl in the first place? Um, I, well, I, to be honest, I tried every kind of symbol um, um, factory or uh, symbol brand, like every kind of, of, of brand that was out there just to, to know what sound I was going for. And I, I exactly remember when the Bison series came out, um, and that was uh, very impressive to me. Um, and they just got better and better, and um, they got so many sounds, so many different sounds in one uh, series. And uh, I don't know, I always liked them, and I tried all the other brands, and... Um, so when it came to the point to, to get endorsed, and uh, that means uh, that you have to decide for one brand, and it should be the brand um, that you that you like best, of course, because just choosing something because you get something cheaper or getting something for free, uh, that doesn't make sense, because um, after all, it's like your sound, it's like how you sound, it. and especially like when you record in a more natural way, um, like I try to do. Um, you can hear the symbols and how they sound naturally, and that's um, that should be all right with with your image of what you want to hear, and that's that's actually the big thing about endorsements and what you want to choose. Not necessarily only go for for the company that um, that can give you something for free, or rather go for for the thing or the sound you identify with, and uh, that was. Perfect, because of course I um, I was interested in Tama before, and um, when I heard that Mindless distributing Tama drums, um, I immediately approached them. Um, because that's a, another thing you need to know, like how companies work together. Um, something I'm curious of is, you know, obviously just with your own projects, you have quite a few musical projects, and then on top of that, you do session work. So, do you have a, like one core kit, one core simple setup you use for a majority of the material you play on, or do, are you constantly changing up your specific drums and your specific cymbals um, for for each of these projects? Um, when we're talking about recordings, um, I use a uh, Tama Bobinga, uh, Star Classic Bobinga set for okay. all the recordings and only in the studio. This is a very expensive setup, I would say. Um, even though for me it's not so expensive, <laughs> but still, it's. <laughs> I mean, it's a uh, it's a great piece of art and a great piece of work, and I don't want to take this on tour and have it damaged or something like that. And uh, you know, drummers can be very picky with 
with equipment stuff. And uh, and so I'm using this one setup for pretty much everything I record. Um, and I also use the same snare drum. And, you know, if I if I need a different sound, like, and it's mostly like bass drums and snare drums, what you always can do is use different drum heads. And Evans provides a, a wide range of, of different sounds. And it also depends how you tune them. And um, most important is how you play them. Like, um, like the way the way you hit the drums affects the sound uh, big time. And if I would go for a different sound, I would just use uh, the instruments I have and tune it differently and maybe play it differently. And then I get a different sound or use a different microphone. And then, um, then you get a different sound. Um, but what I want to do when I have, um, I want to be known for, for a certain sound because I think um, people need to be able to recognize my playing, not only by what I play, but also how, um, how the um, how the drums sound sound itself like if there's I'm, I'm mostly also tuning in the same way like for the session works and for the obscure stuff and it's, it's a very similar setup and it works for for a lot of occasions and the music I record mostly is um, very similar the good thing about the uh, uh, star classic Bobinga is that it um, it's very it's very flexible um, when you record the dry signals, it also depends how you EQ them and how what kind of mixing levels you choose, and um, that way you get either a metal sound or a more hard rock or um, fusion sound. And mm -hmm. there's a wide range of possibilities you can uh, go for with just one kit. On tour, I use a different setup that that's a little. Um, cheaper and um, that's you know not so well it's 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 great quality but why should you take like your best uh, piece on in a club you know these small clubs we play when everything is, is uh, wet and uh, sweaty and you know and so what? Take it. so I have a tour kit which um, is pretty much road proof which and, kit is um, that I have a kit at home which stays there and doesn't move. Uh, what, what kit do you bring on the road then? What, what, what type? Um, it's, it's a Tama Superstar Custom. Actually, I used that kit for recording Omnivium and uh, the last Blooded Science record. Okay. And it, I mean, it, it sounds good. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, I also use it for recordings, but I tend to, to use the Bobinga for recordings um, just a little more. And it came out that this is my like my main recording set and the other one is my main uh, life set it's so, like uh, the people that have the fancy car that they only drive to church on Sundays yeah <laughs> it's a little like that but actually well it, I would say um, it's like a cabriolet like I don't right, drive yeah. when it's raining right yeah. so did, and, did uh, you use that other kit on the blotted science record just for a practical reason or did it have a sound that you were looking for when you did that record um question um it was more a setup thing because um the thomas superstar custom um uh, the the, sh the shells of the drums are lower like um it's called this hyperdrive um system it sounds impressive which, <laughs> it does, yeah thomas hyperdrive superstar yeah. custom hyperdrive it's uh the drum is just more flat. All the toms are a little more flat, but they don't lose um, volume or, um, you know, sound. And it's very practical to set it up because you can set it up very low. And I wanted to have it set up lower because it's it's a little easier this way. And um, since Blooded Science is probably the most difficult stuff I ever recorded, um, I was going for a solution that is just a little easier. And... Um, yeah, I have to say, like, especially on the Blood and Science record, we used, like, a mix of natural drums and um, um, triggered drums, or, like, um, resampled drums. And um, that worked very well. So it, it didn't really depend. Uh, because, I mean, if you know the music of Blood and Science, it's very, I would say, robotic in <laughs> a certain way, like, very technical, very... Um, 
fragmentized. And uh, that way, if you have like a, a trigger, in addition to a natural sound, it, it brings up all the strokes and you can really hear everything. And it's, it's just about the attack. About the attack um, that a natural drum does not necessarily provide unless you play it like, you know, big marching sticks and play as loud as you can every note. But that's not a very a healthy technique to play. And um, you can just, in, in, sometimes you can enhance um, with, uh, with soft, software solution, you can enhance your natural sound a little. And in fact, that's how I would use these kind of, of processors. I wouldn't use it in a way where it's totally, where, where the only thing that is real are the symbols, you know? I wouldn't do that. I would always go for, um, for a mix. Yeah, That's I was what gonna, we hear. So it wasn't so, so important if I used the Bubinga set or the other one. So that was a practical reason, yes. One of the things I like about uh, the recordings that you've played on is that um, they do so, you know, they still sound modern and polished and everything, but they, they also sound real. I can hear the dynamics of the, the drums, you know, I, I, it's, it, I don't feel like I'm hearing like a sampled sound effect. I hear like, exactly. I, it, it sounds like I'm hearing somebody hitting a drum and that's what I really respond to. I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, I feel like with a lot of modern metal drums, we're sort of trying to make a drum set not sound like a drum set. Like the cymbals way down, the kick and snare super loud, every hit exactly the same volume. And that's not, that's not what drums sound like. Um, as somebody who's kind of at the forefront of that scene in a lot of ways, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I would say there's not really a general answer to that. I, because um, even if we agree on, on one thing that um, I like natural drums or drums that, as you say, are a little maybe polished or very clean and, and with a lot of attack, but still have the natural feel to it or the natural response. I like it better and I think most people like it better and I think this is what's coming back. But there might be this one record where a uh, drum machine just fits perfectly. You know, it's it, there is never like this dogma where you can say right. do it this way and only this way. Um, that's the one thing. But in general, like the tendency of, of most recordings is, you know, I don't know why. I think um, it also has to do because um, everything's getting like faster, and uh, uh, apparently when you play faster, you lose a lot of volume. And um, I try not to lose volume when I play fast, or not too much. And this way I get like really harsh signals from recording signals. Um, also when I play fast, and that's coming through, you know, you can hear it on all the cymbal mics when I hit the snare, and you can hear it all um, bleeds into each right. other's mic, into, into each microphone. And that's something I want. Um, that's what makes it sound uh, like a real drum set. Exactly. Like I can remember when we recorded uh, Epitaph, um, that necrophagist record I play on. Um, I think half of what you can hear is room mic, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's one thing because because um, I think that fits very well for a record that is so. Um, how do you how do you say that? Like, it's not very rock and rollish. Right. You know what right. I mean. It's, well, uh, so so to to that note, you know, like the, having the but right. Maybe uh, maybe I sorry uh, I should answer your question. <laughs> what are my thoughts on? I didn't answer that. I kind of was winding around it not to make a point. Um, well, I have to say, I think I think um, this whole drum processing is because it's just easy to produce that way. You don't need a drummer who plays probably. All you right. do is you you record some takes and then you quantize it. That way, it everything sounds perfect, perfect in a in a way right. of how a computer would define perfect, and um, yeah, then you add samples, and it sounds kind of good. It sounds like an industry standard. Yeah, and that's I what it sounds like to me like, as a standard. And it it's like it's like pop music is that way, and if but if you listen to some pop records, like let's say from the eighties or the nineties, they had a good, really good sound. Um, they all sound. Um, individual even if it's kind of an industry standard they don't sound the same and i have 
the impression that with um, Superior Drummer, even though it's a very, very good um, program, um, and you can use it in a very musical way, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are just not using it in a musical way. They use it in a way to sound like every other guy, not to you know, be in danger of doing something else and doing your own thing because uh, when you when you just go with uh, with what everyone does, you can't go wrong so much. It's like a social proof kind of thing. Mm -hmm. To me, that's how I see it. And I always thought like, like that uh, metal and especially extreme metal should be um, something where every record sounds completely different from another. Or like an individual sound of a band should matter. And now uh, apparently like a lot of those bands now these days sound like Meshuggah. <laughs> I don't know why. Just a few. Meshuggah yeah. yeah. right. um, is great, but uh, there's, um, there's. But we already have one Meshuggah. We don't need a yeah. hundred. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. have anything? Um, do you, have, you know, especially because I know you also do some engineering um, and you have a home studio. Do you have any particular techniques for when you're integrating your samples with your actual performance in order to make them sound natural and to make them not sound robotic? Do you go in there and like mess with the dynamics of the MIDI, or do you have like a recording technique or a triggering technique that you know you like to use? Um, no, I record only the um, the real audio signal mm -hmm. and. Everything that maybe is triggered um, mm -hmm. is done afterwards, and um, then we got a sample library, which is my own samples, which I recorded myself, and mostly we use those. Mm -hmm. So um, it depends on for what you use triggers. If we use triggers, we use it for making that attack a little more obvious. Mm -hmm. I, I think and, uh, that what you touched on actually makes a big difference for that naturalness too, because you know I, I found that with you know um, the re the recordings that do make everything sound really natural, and you know what, and the bands that make some of the amateur mistakes, it's exactly what you touched on, like recording your own samples if you can, because you know you're matching your kit with your kit, and it just it sounds like you still. That's true. That's uh, actually one reason. If if you see like back uh, back in the days, like. Um, those early 90 records, um, to make it audible all the, and, and if they weren't triggering and um, of course that technique already existed but it wasn't like um, on that level and it wasn't as easy as it is now but um, when you listen to some of the uh, um, natural recordings what they did is put a lot of high frequencies in the bass drum yeah. or the snare drum to make it audible and this is a very special sound, but of course you lose a lot um, from other frequencies. And what you can do now is have a really nice, perfectly mixed uh, drum set, natural drum set, and then just add the samples which are which fe uh, feature those high frequencies. And that way you have a mix. It's like when you record guitars and, and we have a more clean signal and then you add a, another guitar track that is completely distorted. If you mix them up you can still have both both worlds, both sound worlds and that's a very similar approach to to uh, mixing the drums. All right well we are out of time but thanks again for uh, calling in and uh, we'll talk to you soon.